Now another report from Special Correspondent for Education, John Marrow. Tonight's is about efforts to fix a group of troubled elementary schools in Tennessee. In large cities like Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and New York, efforts to fix failing schools are ongoing with varying degrees of success. But failing schools are also an issue in small cities like Chattanooga, Tennessee, population 310,000. In 2000, a report came out listing the lowest performing elementary schools in all of Tennessee. Nine of the bottom 20 were in inner city Chattanooga. Natalie Elder is the principal of one of these schools. Out of 1,044 schools in the state of Tennessee, I was 1,044. That was the most depressing feeling in the world. The other eight were almost as bad. Reading scores were among the lowest in the state. Behavior problems were rampant, and in some, teachers often did not even show up. Schools lacked basic resources, and the buildings were falling apart, according to Principal Rebecca Everett. John, I walked into a building that had no floors. I walked into a building that the restrooms were completely torn apart. There were snakes crawling around the rafters. We sat down with a group of teachers from several of these schools to find out what they thought. We had principals coming in, principals leaving out, and each time you would get started on a focus, then you change, and then another principal would have another type of focus. The turnover in leadership, of course, led to a high teacher turnover. At the beginning of the year, you know, before school started, a lot of the positions weren't even filled. This was a problem Chattanooga could not ignore. We don't want to have half of the lowest performing schools. Memphis has four times as many poor children and they had two or three schools. We had nine. Dan Challoner is president of Chattanooga's Public Education Foundation, PEF. It was just a moment where everybody said, we have got to do something. The goals are crystal clear. PEF formed a partnership with the Benwood Foundation, also in Chattanooga. Corinne Allen is executive director of the Benwood Foundation. Our trustees said, this is inexcusable, unacceptable. And for the first time in our history, we said we're prepared to put $5 million over the course of five years. This is about everybody saying, we can do this. We know how to do this. Now, how can we help? Together, the two organizations contributed $7.5 million over five years and persuaded other organizations to get involved in what became known as the Benwood Initiative. But only after getting the school system to promise to do whatever it would take to fix those schools. Superintendent Jesse Register was aware of the problems. People would get jobs in the district by agreeing to teach in the inner city schools and they would stay just long enough to get a transfer out, move to another school. So there was a revolving door of new teachers and then there was a group of people who collected who couldn't be successful in other schools. What had happened over time was that the teachers no other schools wanted had been transferred to these low-performing schools. Principal Emily Baker remembers what it was like. There were lots of teachers in this building who really did not have the best interests of children at heart when they came to school every day. Out of, what, 30 teachers in this building? About 30. There were probably 20, 21 who really had stopped teaching a long time ago. As a first step, Superintendent Jesse Register replaced all the principals but one. Is it essential to be able to move people around, clean house? If you have a, a culture in a school that's not uh, working right, you need to be able to change it. And you change that by, uh, by changing some people, by changing leadership teams. Now find a number word. All the teachers in these schools had to reapply for their jobs and pass a test. Initially, people that wanted to leave could apply, and they left. Then those of us who wanted to stay had to reapply for our jobs. And, you know, I had been in the system nearly 30 years at that point. And I thought, you know, this, this is really a difficult thing for me to do. I have never been so upset because I said, you know, they were throwing questions at me left to right. I had to do a writing prompt. It, it was just awful. When the dust settled, the nine Benwood schools had about 100 teaching positions to fill. 
I know a lot of people who um, were recruited to come into Benwood schools who were not ready until after that those reconstitutions mm -hmm. took place. They were like, well, weed out some of that poison because that's what some of those teachers were considered mm -hmm. to be, the ones that, right. like you said, would not change. They did not embrace improvement. What to do with the 100 teachers who were leaving the Benwood schools was the next problem. How are you doing, honey? Register asked principals in the district's suburban schools to absorb okay, them. What I said to them was, I want each of you to consider being principal of one of these schools and consider the fact that you might have 10 or 12 teachers that need a lot of help. One principal can't do that, but you can be effective with one teacher who needs help. I ask every one of the principals to take one and help them become better. All the principals agreed to take between one and three teachers, but some in the community were opposed to this. If the teachers were not good enough to teach in the inner city schools, why were they good enough to teach out in the suburbs? School board member Rhonda Thurman was outraged. The principals had a problem with it because they were getting teachers that they didn't want. But yet, by the same token, they had to be responsible for their performance. And some of them were told they had to take these teachers, that these teachers were coming to their school whether they wanted them or not. Why didn't you just fire them? Why spread them around? We have tenure laws here, and it would have been a mistake to do that. Those a lot of those teachers have been reassigned and are very effective in other schools today. To attract new teachers and retain the old ones, the Benwood Initiative offered incentives, help with a mortgage, bonuses for high performance, and a tuition-free master's degree. Do kids send you a lot of nonverbal messages? Sure they do. Teachers getting tuition for the graduate degree must promise to remain at the Benwood schools for at least four years. The Benwood Initiative also provided teachers with much needed training in how to understand test scores. Pre-Benwood, we would review the test data. I didn't have a clue as to how to take that data and make changes the next year. We didn't have the professional development, mm -hmm. nor the collegiality, and so a lot of times you were intimidated to let someone else know that you were that feeling you insecure. Know. And altogether, I have three sets of five. Every Benwood school was given funds to hire what they call a consulting teacher, whose job it is to support and guide the other teachers at the school. Sylvia Green has been doing this for the past few years. How did you think that went? How do you think your lesson went? Well, I, I think that they were enjoying the lesson. I could teach a writing lesson and come to Sylvia and say, Sylvia, I don't think I'm getting it. I, I don't think the kids are understanding. Maybe I'm not teaching the right way. And Sylvia, Sylvia will come into my classroom and teach a writing lesson to my children. And I'm learning just like the children are learning. Mm -hmm. and, and we do that all the time. Let's think about some great vacation spots. Before long, teachers in the Benwood schools were watching each other teach and spending their free time figuring out ways to improve. I think back in the days when we were just all on our own mm -hmm. because we never really knew, are we doing the right thing? You know, and when somebody came in and wanted particularly a peer, you were very nervous about it, but not now. I mean, we're in and out of each other's classes constantly all day long. Hmm. Now, they're teaching their students to collaborate in much the same way. Five years later, disciplinary problems are down, attendance is up, and test scores have been moving in the right direction. That was the biggest relief for us. It was a joy for the teachers, and now they felt the work was was worth it. It's, it's worth what we're doing because now we can see our scores are starting to rise. Go the district reports that today nearly three quarters of Benwood third graders are reading at grade level. There's a long way to go, but these schools started at the bottom of the pile. What is a shade? The changed culture of these schools means that filling teacher vacancies is no longer a problem. This is the list of the people who are bidding on my school. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of names. And then on top of that, I have all of these resumes of people who are interested in coming to Clifton Hills. Another change. Principals from the Chattanooga suburbs, including Vivian Woods, now look to the Benwood schools for guidance. It seemed like the whole boat had turned upside down in about four years. 
and all of a sudden, we're getting information from them. The goal of the Benwood Initiative was to have every third grader reading at grade level by this year. By that measure, they fell short. We fought a good fight when you look at where this we came right. from. Mm -hmm. And we're still fighting. We've not given up the yet. But we have come over. The battle is not over. It's we're ours. still fighting. That's right. Superintendent Jesse Register is retiring this summer, which raises a question. Will the Benwood Initiative continue to thrive? How fragile is the success of these schools? I, I don't think that the people who work in those schools will allow them to change back. Mm -hmm. We are here. We're here to stay. Where there's a will, there's, there's a, way. a way. Can this work in other places? It can work everywhere. In some, uh, it, you, you have to look at each community, but basically we're talking about having good leadership teams and good teachers and good support systems for children, and that can work everywhere. Jocelyn, how do I write 30? The ongoing success of the Benwood schools hinges on continued private funding. The Benwood Foundation assured us it intends to continue its support. And finally tonight, the going of Dan Rather. Jeffrey Brown has our media unit report. Dan Rather was once the face of CBS News. He logged 44 the years at the network, 24 in the anchor chair of the evening news. This is the CBS. But the announcement today that the storied newsman was leaving was not a surprise. Rather hasn't anchored the news since March of last year. He's filed only occasional stories for 60 Minutes this year and was last seen on the network last weekend on the program Sunday Morning. Rather's reputation suffered after a 60-minute story about President Bush's Vietnam-era service in the National Guard. That story relied on documents that ultimately could not be authenticated. In early 2001, more than three years before the National Guard story aired, NewsHour correspondent Terrence Smith interviewed Rather and asked him about his future. Dan Rather, he's been in that chair 20 years, almost 20 years. Uh, how long does he want to be in it? For as long as I can do it and do it up to my own standards and the standards of CBS News. You know, Terry, you and I worked together for a long time. I think you know me well enough that what I know and about all I know is um, to work hard, try hard, uh, trust in hard work, determination, perseverance, and know that the best motto for the long pull is don't grumble, just keep plugging away. And that's how I feel about this job. I love this job. I love everything about it. I want to do it uh, for as long as my health holds and as long as I can meet our standards.